Here's a place where all of us can be safe. Our stories of transformation can be safe, and all the things we want to research are safe here. This is Safe Space with Cheyenne. I'm really excited you're here, and I hope you stick around for a while, because I've got a lot to show you before I leave Earth. I love you guys. Welcome back, all my beautiful friends. I have a returning guest for my first and... Hmm... My first project is probably the best way I would say it. It's near and dear to my heart. It's literally tattooed on my arm. It was my first my first podcast. It's called Spiritual Smorgasbord. Nada popped into my life in a very magical way, which usually what is what happens when you live in a world of synchronicity and vibration, or at least you're aware that you live in that world. And he was recommended to me as kind of this like traveling healer that had spent time in front of many mystical practitioners at the time is the best way I could say it. You're definitely going to have to go back and listen to his episode. But when he dropped into my life, um, I was already really excited to get his origin story and figure out what he's doing now to help humanity. Um, And in order for me to really talk about someone's services and what they do, I always ask if they're willing to set an appointment up with me in the beginning so I can also then kind of give like a personal nod, like, yeah, you should go see this person. So luckily he was in Wichita, we got together and I had an amazing healing experience with him. My favorite part of the story was where I said within the first five minutes, he was grabbing on a sore muscle on my shoulder and he was speaking tongues and pulling this energy out. And I was completely hooked to whatever he had learned and what he was doing. Um, I always say I have a Mary Poppins bag of tricks now and I just keep adding to it. And that's definitely how I felt in the session when I was with him. So throughout not just meeting him, having the interview, and then becoming a friend of mine, in the midst of this, we had met and he was getting ready to move to New Mexico. So as we were packing up his house, production was being done on his episode. And I remember at the end of the episode, I was like, if you want to keep up with Nada, like, here's all of his information. You never really know where he's going to wander. But if you find yourself in front of him, like, you definitely just want to spend some time with him and have him have, what's the best way of saying that? Divinity run through him, I guess, is the nice way of saying it, if you believe that we're all vessels for the divine. So now Nada's coming back on today to update us a little bit on what he's been doing, but definitely I want to get into his main goal of the sound temples that he wants to heal. He's definitely considered a sonic mystic. He has these sound transmissions that I'm going to link for you guys too, so you can check out on your own. I put them on for meditation and I put them on very loud because they work instantly when you listen to them. And for me, there's just something so personable about knowing someone that creates the sound frequency that just connects you more to them. So Nada, thank you so much for coming on and continuing your story with us and also bringing quite a topic I'm excited to get in with you today. My pleasure, dear. My pleasure. Okay, so you went to New Mexico and you had a couple adventures. And I know it could be a whole episode just describing on what happened in New Mexico up to this point and what you're doing now, but give us some bullet points of the expansion that you've had even since I've met you. All of your dreads are gone. That was the biggest thing that I saw when I finally saw your face. That was a really big shedding that you went through. You had a trip to Mexico. You've done some other travels, some healing events, establish a couple other companies to ultimately benefit the ultimate goal of building sound temples. So update us tell us what you're doing yeah thank you um yeah new mexico as soon as i got here i was plunged into inner darkness basically um that was (laughs) that was uh about a year and a half ago i guess i would have been january of last year and i immediately just started you know um you know, being someone that has been on a healing path of healing PTSD from early childhood for many years at this point, um, I thought I had really, you know, reached a particular um, state of that where I wasn't going to be doing the deep stuff anymore. It was just more uh, nonsense, really, um, looking back on that. But it's always nice to feel like maybe that could be true, right? Um 
but anyway, as soon as I got to New Mexico, I recognized what was happening was that I was now out of the field of Kansas where I grew up. And there's an interesting thing that happens when you're working with trauma. Sometimes you need to revisit the scene of the crime, so to speak, in order to do to get to, get to particular layers um, in your energetic anatomy that you couldn't otherwise, but it would be harder to get to at least. And then also you kind of have to leave in order to let some other some more of those layers come off. And that's really what I what I found happening after living in, in Kansas for two years. Um, I found that now that I was in this more spacious land and very, very healing lands out here in the mountains here in uh, New Mexico, um, I was just allowed to unravel more. So that was, that was a long process that is really just now reaching its completion, I believe. And through that, I've really started to recognize how tied to the solar cycles, a lot of what I've experienced in my healing path has been um, been really um, diligent lately about checking the solar weather and l- keeping a log of what symptoms I might be experiencing and how that relates to number of sunspots or you know solar flare activity. And I found a direct correlation for me because um, you know when I when I started really struggling. Um, on my path, and we went into this in, in your um, your previous podcast endeavor. Um, but uh, when I first started on a spiritual path, it was bu- with Buddhism back in LA, and I was a programmer at the time. And immediately after I started meditating, I uncovered all this anxiety right under the surface. And so, just recently, I connecting the dots with the sun, I went back and was like, looked in my calendar and was trying to piece together. Okay, when did I start? meditating and i found all the little google calendar dates like that were shown where i went to shambhala center and i had a lesson in zazen over here and uh, okay so i got a time frame and then i checked the um the the solar cycle record for that and i recognized that okay well that was the peak of the previous um solar cycle and these cycles are about i think they're about five five six years um and uh, so it would directly correlate with the peak of that solar activity, which is right about where we're, we're at right now. We're getting to, we're almost to what is the projected peak of this solar cycle. And it's the intensity that I've been experiencing is making a lot more sense in, in that, um, with that lens in mind. So um, a lot of healing this past year and a half, uh, a lot of learning, a lot of shedding of identity, uh, identities that I didn't even know that I needed to shed, you know, um, things that were holding me back, you know, uh, something that I recognize that I created this version of myself um, with a maybe what we might call a very like protective but f- falsely inflated masculine so it's it, it, especially if if you know you're carrying a y, a y chromosome and you're traumatized in early childhood like your your masculine side is going to take a hit right you're going to be you're going to have some uh specific trauma around that the expression of any kind of masculine or solar energy if we want to remove gender from the equation here let's call it solar energy and it, for very good reason, right? It's very tied to the sun. And uh, so this solar energy gets kind of repressed or stunted because you are have you have this trauma in a way. And what had happened in my initial kind of awakening process uh, was that, you know, I was freed of the identity that I had held for 30 some odd years. But in its place, I needed something else. Like our egos are here for a reason, right? They're not meant to like run the show, but they're also not meant to go away. That's how we relate with each other is through our egos. So there's a lot, there's a lot of ego bashing that goes around and I'm, I'm a big defender of the ego. I think egos are great. I think they're beautiful things. So it's, it's how, it's how we like tell each other apart Mm -hmm. (laughs) in this particular realm. Right. Um, 
So what I did was I unconsciously, of course, uh, created this version of myself that that had that masculine presence that I had I'd really been lacking my entire life. And uh, you know, it was funny at this at the at this time too, um, in this initial awakening process, that was when I really started tuning into my gender identity because for the first time I was maybe for the it, when I was growing up it wasn't as much of a um uh what's the word I'm looking for much much of a common thing really there's a better there's a better term for that but um a popular kind of awareness of gender identity there was it's a binary you're a boy or a girl you're born with boy parts or girl parts right you mark it on your birth certificate and that's what you are and and as we you know now it's it's more complex than that and and I think uh, that just wasn't shown as a possibility when I was growing up. So as soon as this this experience happened and I'm freed of all these old identities and I'm questioning everything about myself, I'm like, who the fuck am I? Like, why am I here? What the fuck am I doing? Why does everything hurt? <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, why do I feel like I'm not a man? Oh, holy shit, I've never felt like a man. Well, that's weird. Okay, well, I don't feel like a woman either. <laughs> so what the fuck am I? I was like, well, there's this thing called non-binary. Okay, well, that sounds about right. You know, that seems that seems very in keeping. Like, I kind of identify these masculine and feminine solar lunar energies in my being, and they're always in flux, and they're fluid, and that, that feels good to me. So I was like, okay, well, I'll check that box, you know, given the chance. Um, but otherwise, I'm probably just not going to think about it because I don't go around thinking about my gender very much. You know, I really just kind of exist. And occasionally if I go to the bathroom and I look down and I'm rec- I recognize the genitals that are down there, and I'm like, oh, that's right. I was born with those. That's what I'm using right now. Cool. Um, but that's about as far as it goes most of the time. But, but when I reach the kind of like uh, the dramatic kind of uh, crescendo of this this last cycle of healing, it was around the new year, um, let's see, December of last year. And I was just filled with this knowing that I had to release my jata, my locks and my beard. And I didn't know why I had no idea why, but it was clear that that was what I needed to do. I was like, okay, I'm offering this to Kali. This is going back to her. And, and as soon as I did, like it, it just sparked another process of, of transformation of like shedding all this like persona that I created. That's what I, what I call hippie nada, like the, the, the not a dreadlocks and the beard. Right. The, um, and, and I realized how constricting that had come. Like it would, it really served me really well for years, but it, I outgrown it and it was now in the way of what I wanted to do. Um, so through that process, like I was able to like really reconnect with, you know, the essence of my being and my gender expression and um, not feel so tied down by that kind of artificial construct. Um, now, to be fair, I think we're creating these artificial constructs all the time. We're creating and destroying them like in small ways in every moment. But this was a rather major one for me. And then um not too long after that um my cohort and i nadia uh nadia black um we ha- have started a an organization called the black magic underground where we're offering uh, all manner of different magical kind of uh, energetic spiritual offerings uh, but most dear to my heart is the sound temple um which we're offering online and in person. And so that's really where the the bulk of my energy has been spent lately is, is in um, really refining that and in getting those offerings out into the world. Amazing. Your explanations are always so full of wind, but I, I wait to see how it all connects and comes out over and over and over. And then like there's, I'm like, oh yes, I want to remember to say something here and say something here. Um, going back to when you were studying Buddhism in LA and really getting into meditation and finding the undertow of anxiety for the first time 
And then fast forwarding to the part where you're like, I like to defend the ego. Um, and I love talk about the ego um, from anybody's perspective that wants to give it. Because I do think that there's a falsity, especially in the beginning of a spiritual awakening. When you have that first recognition that you aren't your thoughts, you aren't your ego, just as much as you aren't your job, you aren't your house, you aren't your clothes, you aren't the persona that you tell people you are. Um, and in Buddhism, it always goes back to purifying your disposition. You know, everybody thinks you have to rid yourself of all this darkness and then like light remains. And you can find that in so many different texts. It's honestly overwhelming and unattainable, especially in one lifetime. But the understanding of purifying your disposition and both of these are you and the darkness is just void of light and void of love. So going back to the shadow aspects of yourself, because I know shadow work and shadow self is a really big thing. Um, for people to identify these traumas that are stuck inside of them, whether they realize it or not. When you first have that spiritual expansion, it kind of is like, oh, how, how dare you, ego? And you still kind of want to like blame it like Satan, like you didn't do it. It was this entity controlling you the whole time. But the shadow side was always, as painful as it is, it's some of my greatest work that I really got to go I said dredge the subconscious and figure out like why I did perceive myself this way, act this way, do these things. And there were points where I did want to like shy away from it and just be like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done with this part of the work. Like I get it. Shadow work. Um, but when I really just sat on the phrase purify your disposition and blending, not only did I see correlations between like balancing masculine and feminine energy but a lot of the things that I see are always about balancing this certain energy in a certain body whether it's your physical your astral your ethereal emotional name on down the line how many bodies you have I've always found it astounding the absolute fight that people have over the ego Obviously, going and realizing that the hippie persona, so to speak, which that was definitely the nada that I met, um, I think it's a really powerful thing to say, like, I'm getting this knowing inside of me that I have to make this move to shed myself of, even though it's a good persona, it's a spiritual persona, it's still another layer away from my true self. There's something authentic that wants to be hidden and doesn't want to come out. And I think it just shows a lot of strength and transparency in your journey for being able to shift from those, those places of yourself. Just like you taught me, this was a lower octave of myself. I don't identify with this anymore. I just understand it happened and I want to understand why it happened. So just as that octave has served you and now you're at this one, I'm sure you're going to plateau into something else or you know maybe you'll just finally turn into light body i'm not really sure but i always enjoy hearing your story and having you unravel the ways that you're really able to identify what's going on with you i'm definitely a retrospector like i'll journal and i'll go through it but it takes like a notebook and some meditation and a while to breathe some space between a lot of things that happen so especially in healing work you referenced your PTSD and how you've consistently tried to move, not move away from it, but heal it so it obviously doesn't pull you back. And when I started going through a lot of my healing stuff, I pulled out all my notebooks to kind of see where it began, what I wasn't facing, what actually did happen, and like how long my disassociation had kind of happened. Because I had like gaps in memories on stuff, but luckily I wrote it down. And going through those was revolutionary for realizing that things happen to you that are traumatic that you don't even realize. And then you find yourself like 15 years later on a lady's Reiki bed and you don't even know what Reiki is. But somebody recommended to you, there's a little ping in your body that's like, yes, that's for me. I should go do that. And then this woman brings up something that you know happened and you have no idea how she saw it. And I think a story just as simple as that is how it can blow up all of the shadow work in your face. And then you end up like people like you and me that start going down rabbit holes and have the red strings tied across diagrams in our head trying 
to connect. Like, what were they talking about in this ancient text? Oh, they're talking about the same thing. They're using different words. Where's the origin of this? Where's the origin of this? And that's where kind of the rabbit hole terminology goes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Which leads me to my next topic of what you brought on for us to talk about today. <laughs> so you sent me a text message, and I wrote it down so I could just say it bare bones. I said, what do you want to talk about besides your story and the sound temples? And you wrote back, ancestral trauma decolonizing our spirituality by unraveling the distortions in tarot and astrology. And we had a 30-minute conversation, so I knew what way this was kind of going to go. But you bring up so much amazing history, and I've never actually thought about it like that, condensed like that. I've had pieces of, like, information, conversations in my head, like, oh, that ties, that ties. I'm a part of that. My ancestors are in that. I have ancestral trauma here. But the way that you delivered it, I mean... Really, it was just like a published paper, you know? It was wonderful. So I want to give you the mic, so to speak, and talk to me about all of the things that you've really uncovered after you've finally found that like tarot and astrology is definitely a big part of the work that you do as well. Yeah, well, let's start with um, the, the tarot, I think, because that's where I really started. Um, and, you know, I think what I was encountering as, cause I just don't, I don't do anything like just a little bit, right? Like that's not my nature. Like I have to dive head first, like as deep as I can go and I'll hit the bottom and I'll still be scratching and digging, trying to get deeper. Yeah. Like there's artifacts underneath that nobody else. Yeah. Like I'm all buddy, just like, you know, like looking for something treasure at the bottom of the pool. Um, so that's, that's where I've been with, with the tarot lately and um, I kept following the tradition backwards because that's a good way to, you know, if you're encountering anything that doesn't resonate or you want to understand something, what do you do? You kind of look into the history of it, right? So that's, that's what I was doing. And I was, what I was encountering was like this initially, like all these systems, like the preponderance of tarot is out there today, like 90 some odd percent, um, in my non-scientific study have, are based on the golden dawn system which golden dawn is uh, a magical cult society out of uh out of england i believe london or england mm -hmm. in the what, late 1800s and that's where you get your alistair crowley's and your arthur Waite, um who between the two of them made the two most popular tarot decks of all time you have the uh the toth tarot by crowley and the the writer Waite Smith. Um, I was like, Dad, that make sure that Smith is included because I would like yeah. to interject for people that get freaked out when they hear Alistair Crowley's name. This is uh -huh. the Golden Dawn was actually where he was his most sane with the light of esotericism. Uh -huh. I would just like to point that out because I was very confused and conflicted because I know the lore of Alistair Crowley and what he turned into. Um, and I think that's a story of being infiltrated and alternating to a spiritual ego and acting like you can't be infiltrated in a state. Because he definitely, you know, obviously did some stuff afterwards that could almost discredit the love and the light that was supposed to be in his original stuff, which technically was the Golden Dawn, which you can go and Google the history of it yourself for sure. Um, it's magnificent. It obviously talks about higher minds in the society, the religious oppression of the society, and they knew that this ancient knowledge needed to be carried out in a different way. So their intention in the beginning of this, where the Thoth deck was created, um, I do believe had some of the best intentions in the world. But for anybody listening that gets a little irked by Crowley's name, this was the Crowley before that one. Just to interject. Alistair Crowley was the original Marilyn Manson. Let's just, yes. I, I want to put that in. That's a great like way of saying was, that. He was putting on a stage show for everyone. He loved to play the villain and freak people out. Like that, and so that's, and you see that to this day. It's a hundred years later, almost a hundred years later from a lot of his, a lot of his work. Um, 
and you still have people on the internet repeating the same kind of like conspiratorial uh, things that they did back in the day from the newspapers about him eating babies and sacrificing kids and stuff like that. I'm not like, really um, worried about what the newspaper said because I don't trust that. But um, I guess it's the accounts that I read from the other people, like when it actually disbanded and like why it disbanded, how it disbanded. And I followed the personalities of each person in the group to kind of see like, where are they now? What happened? Where did they go? What happened to this beautiful intention to pass ancient knowledge onto people in a proper, unconvoluted way? Like, that's where my mind went when I started reading this. Because I was like, I know his original work. And, I mean, I recognize the light in it. I recognize the origin in it. But where did all of this go so wrong? And, I mean, we're going to have to skip the part with journalism. Because that's just, that's just another no no that we could get into and how that's definitely used against good and bad people but continue well his whole thing of like the the persona that he put out there of the b666 and all that stuff it was a total you know it was a total play like he was messing with everybody he was like you want me to be the villain you want me to be this evil creature i'll act like an evil creature and you know it, it's especially funny in light of the realization that 666 has nothing to do with the devil, even if we want to dissect revelations and get into that rev that whole rabbit hole. Oh my but, gosh. No, let's we do stick that. to ancestral Except trauma, so. please. Except <laughs> so. It will be in like eight rabbit holes deep at this point. So yes. um, we're in the curly rabbit hole right now. And we need to kind of back out of that one because it's a little yucky. Yeah. So <laughs> we don't want to be in here too long. Yeah. But I'll say that like, I don't think Curly was a bad guy. I think he had good intentions. I think he was an excellent scholar. And he was probably really, he probably really knew his stuff as far as like the book learning side of that Western occult path. Like oh, he I seemed mean, to, he seemed to be really, in the really good. Deck. It's amazing how it intertwines so, so many other rabbit holes that you could go down. So yes, I will 100% agree with you. Amazing scholar. So, I mean, but to get back to the the, the tarot here, I, I like it, Jack, the the top tarot, but that that one really is is what sent me down um, a big part in unraveling a lot of this because there were things about it that weren't sitting right with me. I was like, I don't these astrological correspondences and all these things they didn't the the Hebrew alphabet how it was attributed it didn't it didn't resonate for me. So um, I wanted to find out why. So I studied it and I found out, okay, well, this is the Golden Dawn system. This is the same system that I'm finding in all these other decks. Um, I need to follow this back to its source and see where it came from so that I can find out what feels right to me. And through this, uh, through this process, what I found was like the Golden Dawn really fabricated this system of correspondences um, and there's, there are several hundred years of documented history of the tarot before this point in history. So for most of our, the, the existence of tarot, this, these, this correspondence system didn't exist. And now if people are confused about what I'm talking about correspondence system, I'll just explain a little bit, but, um, like in, in the tarot, what I'm talking about is like the card of the magician, uh, being attributed to a planet and a letter of the Hebrew alphabet or a, part, a sign of the Zodiac or anything else, really. Like you can come up with, or especially in the occult tradition, there are volumes and volumes and volumes of nothing but tables of correspondences. And it's one of the hermetic principles of like, if something feels, acts, smells, tastes kind of like another thing, they are connected. It's kind of a basic hermetic principle. Um, and, and so they have like these grimoires just full of correspondences where like Apple connects to tapestry, connects to the moon on Wednesday, you know, and you, you use all of these to con conduct your ceremonies. And for me, I'm like, oh my God, this is so mental. Like, I don't like, that's way too mental for spirituality, but I'm also intrigued. I'm like, okay, well, why though? Why? And that was the question I asked. Why? Cause it's not enough for me to read the table and to have the document, no matter how trustworthy the source is. I want them to show their work. And my problem was I was not able to find any of uh, any case of the Golden Dawn showing their work and how they came up with these things. Maybe it's out there. I would love to see it if somebody has it, but I couldn't find it. 
And so what I but what I found instead was the history before that. And I saw like, OK, well, it wasn't always like this. So maybe they were right. Maybe they weren't. Maybe there is no right. You know, maybe maybe it's all wrong. <laughs> maybe it's all right. But we're all right. It's OK. I'm OK. You're OK. It's all good. Um, what I think is happening with a lot of these, what, what I know is happening with specifically the tarot is that the way this reality works, we can come, and I've seen this happen in sound healing, for instance, like you can come up with a system that makes absolutely no sense. You can say that this chakra is associated with 420 hertz and it's going to work. You can come up with a correspondence system for your energetic anatomy that's mapped to frequency and it will work because we create this reality, right? Like, so we, we can come up with any construct and it's going to fucking work to a certain degree. So that's what happens with the tarot. It's going to take anything. And the tarot is especially a very reflective, adaptive being. Like this being has been around for a very, very long time. We only know about it for the last five, 600 years in like documented in history, but I believe it's ancient. I believe it's as, as old as anything is old uh, because it's archetypal. It's an archetypal um, energy matrix, right? That will take anything, any symbols, any correspondences you throw at it and it will absorb it and morph and turn it and reflect it back to you. And so the Golden Dawn system, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It probably does work. Like I've had great readings with a lot of Golden Dawn uh, system cards. But when I was looking for them to show their work, I couldn't find it. So I found what came before and that was the Pappas and the Tela's and I'm probably not saying that right. Tela, Tela. Um, and back and back and back. So what I found the earliest tarots that we have are uh, Italian in origin. And most of those are um, are were commissioned by wealthy families. And the I believe all of them actually, uh, all the early ones were commissions. So these these families would pay an artist um, and probably an artist of some sort of with some level of occult initiation because there's so much rich symbology in these things you have to know what you're doing in order to to interpret these things um let alone like actually like create a new version of them and uh the earliest example that we have of a complete tarot deck is the sola busca tarot and it is it's from Italy in, I believe, the 15th century. And it's 78 cards, 22 major arcana, 56 minor arcana. So the same structure that we're familiar with today. But it's entirely pagan. Like there is none of the religious um, symbology that we're familiar with today in it. And it's very weird. And it also, it's, and you start to recognize as you're going through it, oh, I recognize this from the Rider Wade Smith. Like the, she, Pamela, uh, Pamela Coleman Smith went to the the I believe the British Museum or don't quote me on that some museum that was holding this Solabuska somewhere in in Europe I'm assuming and was studying these cards and she interpreted them and brought them into her designs um, because it's not uh, it's not a pip deck like most of the other older decks are it has picks it has pictures in place of the minor arcana so four of swords is not just four swords it's going to show a scene depicting like what the energy of that card is so that that's the the solo buscuits are earliest complete example so that was intriguing to me and then is after that we have um a lot of marseilles and i'm probably skipping it over some but this i'm going to do that because this is what i've studied I'm not an authority on this. I'm just speaking my opinion and my journey here. Um, the Marseilles were, um, came in a little bit later, uh, about a, a century later, I believe. And this is when you start to see the, the tarot um, popularized a little bit more. So it's actually printed. It's not commissioned on an individual one-on-one -on -one hand painted basis. Um, it's it's actually printed with wood blocks or something, and 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 uh, we have many examples of, of Marseille tarots at this point. And what we see with the Marseille tarot, in, in contrast with the Solabusca, is 
a lot of Judeo-Christian iconography. And as I dive into this, well, what I'm finding is, oh, there's this thing called crypto-Judaism. What is this? I've never heard of this before. Well, what happened um, is at the time of the the advent of the Marseille Tarot, uh, or at least the ones that we um, are aware of, uh, it was illegal to practice Judaism in France. So your choice back then apparently was to convert or leave or you know, I'm presuming die <laughs> or be imprisoned. Um, so what happened is a lot of Jewish people publicly converted to Catholicism, but privately practiced their faith. So that's known as crypto, crypto Judaism. And what seems to have happened is they, um, some group at some point decided to hide this information in the tarot deck. So there's a, a, many, many, many examples of Jewish themes that go through the tarot deck, but it's it's presented in a way that's heavily obfuscated. So you really have to know what you're looking for. And um, it also aligns a lot with, you know, you know, the, the Torah is included in the Bible, right? So the, the predominant religion of, of in France at the time was Catholicism. So the Catholic Church was running the show. So it, as long as it looked like a, a story from the Bible, if anything, then it was okay. So you have a lot of veiling of information through this process. And this is one of those um, colonial distortions that I encountered, one of many that I encountered in this journey that, that really kind of kept lighting me up and making me like go deeper because I wanted to find out what was behind that distortion. What's the underlying pattern? What were they trying to cover up? What was so dangerous to this institution that these people felt worthy of risking their lives to hide it in cards? So um, so we, that, that's where we're at with the Marseille Tarot. We have some heavily veiled references to maybe astrology, maybe uh the the jewish uh the hebrew alphabet rather and then we have these correspondence systems that are um that are elucidated in the writings of pappas and matea and and worth and some others and they're using a different system from the golden dawn and so at some point in this journey i end up going down an astrology rabbit hole because you can't talk about tarot without talking about astrology because they're just completely interwoven and I went through a very similar process of just finding like, okay, well, this doesn't resonate. Why is this this way? Like I've got, there's something, something's off here. And where, where it started with me is, is in uh, the whole sidereal versus tropical uh, astrology debate. And I recognized that as I started learning about this, I recognized that the sidereal charts that I was looking at for myself were resonating while the tropical ones weren't. And I wanted to find out why. And so what what I realized through this was that, you know, I mean, that the the sidereal astrology is astrologically more accurate. Like you can get an app on your phone right now, day or night, and look at where the planets and the stars are. So you can see, you don't have to pull up an astrology app. You can type a search in the box for where Mars is, and make and see where it is in the zodiac and that's what the sign it is and then go look at your astrology app if it's tropical and it's going to tell you something entirely different so what's up with that right and we have to go all the way back to unravel this so western astrology is known to be tropical mainly there is it's a minority of of people in western astrology that, that use sidereal um and that started back in like the 40s or 50s i believe um, um, a guy named uh, Fagan, as I recall, and uh, but it goes way further back. Vedic astrology is primarily sidereal, and um, when I started looking into the history of this, what I found was that what we know as us modern astrology today is really this this amalgam of all of these different traditions. We have um egyptian astrology and babylonian astrology we have some other um, arabic influences and 
and some influences of Vedic astrology. And there's a lot of cross pollination happening until you get up into the Hellenistic period where it all seems to kind of, um, kind of uh, synergize together. And then we, we have something that's more recognizable as modern astrology. We have, you know, the wheel of the year with the 12 signs of the Zodiac you have the the 36 decans from which was taken from the egyptian lineage and uh the seven classical planets meaning the, the planets that we can see with the naked eye which you know if you think about that it makes sense you know like at some point in our history that's probably for a large part of the history of astrology that was probably what people relied on is what they can see with their eyes so um I, as I started unraveling this and unraveling this, I found, you know, this, some great references on Hellenistic astrology and Hellenistic, the Hellenistic period is when the Greeks came in to this, this period, uh, to this area uh, of like Mesopotamia and Egypt. And um, uh, they kind of mixed all these things together with Greek philosophy. And what happened in, in this process was uh at that time the sidereal and tropical zodiacs were totally aligned um they're not aligned today because of the precession of the equinoxes and we're so we're several thousand two or thirty-three thousand years out of alignment with the uh the sidereal and the tropical zodiac meaning i grew up thinking i was a libra i'm actually a virgo if i look at my sidereal chart so everything's off by about one sign and um that was that was just the beginning and i recognized that okay well wh why is this the case like why are we relying on something that's just not true like we're looking up at the you can look up at the scars the stars at night and see where this planet is like why is my astrology app telling me something entirely different like this doesn't make sense and it really comes down to the greek influence and in that they had this uh, geocentric view of the solar system where the earth is at the center. They refused to believe that the sun was at the center. I believe that the ancestors before them knew that sidereal astrology was more accurate. I believe that's where all the star map temples that we see all around the world were used, were, were built according to sidereal astrology because it's more accurate and there, people are able to um, uh, better uh, predict things are going to move and with respect to the earth and all these things so um that's one of the original distortions in that process that i uncovered and, and beyond that uh what happened was the greeks also took the babylonian system and assimilated it and they took their they had different names for all of the the planets and the zodiac i believe um and what the Greeks just renamed them. They said, oh, okay, well, this sounds like Inanna Ishtar sounds like Venus. So we're just going to call this Venus, right? So they did that with all the planets. And that's what we have today is that, that influence. And an interesting thing I started noticing in myself through this process, was like, what is happening? I had this point where I was driving, I was listening to this astrology podcast, debating about sidereal and tropical astrology. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's happening here? I know what this feeling is. Oh my God, I'm I'm unraveling and healing ancestral trauma right now <laughs> as I drive through the mountains listening to this podcast. So um, I pray that someone else has that experience while they're listening to this. That's <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> um, but yeah, through through examining these things, we can actually unravel and heal ancestral trauma. If you are of European descent or you live in a country in Europe or you live in a country of Western culture or have just been influenced by Western culture in any way, this applies to you. So basically almost everyone that would be able to listen to a podcast, this is going to apply to you. Especially if you have European ancestry, you have the trauma in your blood of being colonized. You have the trauma in your blood of having your spirituality ripped away from you. Because what did the what did the colonizers do? Their weapon of choice is to disenfranchise the people and disempower them by taking away their source of strength and power, which is their spirituality. So the first people to die are the healers and the, and the the shamans or the the spiritual leaders. Those are the first people 
put on the pyre, off with their heads, right? Good way to disempower everyone. Cut out the heart. Cut the umbilical cord to the earth. Cut out the heart. So I recognized that, you know, I had really had this instinctual rejection of all things Western spirituality for most of my life from my experiences after post experiences in the church as a child through baby Jesus out with the bathwater. That's a whole nother story. Right. But from that point on, I had this like rejection of all things, Western spirituality. And I went full on Eastern Buddhism, Hinduism, all this stuff. And what I only recently came to realize is why that happened. And I could attribute it to past lives. And yeah, I have those too, but more relevant to the topic at hand is that, you know, I feel like a lot of us with this trauma, uh, what we do is we push Western spirituality aside in favor of some Eastern spirituality or something else that we're not connected to by blood because it's easier because it's not as, uh, it's not as loaded and trigger happy, you know, (laughs) triggering, I guess trigger happy triggering whatever same thing um so that was what i was witnessing through this process was that i'm digging into this now because i was able to heal enough of this that i was able to face this ancestral trauma and see it and let it allow it to come up and heal by unraveling those distortions and by sometimes just oftentimes by just viewing something and feeling what comes up in you that's enough to let it go and that's what I was watching happen here. It's remarkable how you can go through all of that information and even cite like books and authors and places. I'm astounded at not only are you amazing at rabbit holes, but you're amazing at presenting the information that you find. And again, you say like, this is just your personal experience with digging through these. So I'm sure there's plenty other variations from other people's perspective, but it's so accurate um i've said it before and i'll say it again if you want to study religion or anything with spirituality sadly you have to study war because just like you said they go for the druids perfect example they go for the elders they chop them first they plunge everybody into the depths of fear cut them from their beliefs their knowing their you know god source is the kindest way I could say it and then they give you an ultimatum or it's like death or come with us death or come with us in the name of whatever religion that they're spewing at the time too and Mm. it really is astounding because I think back to when I started going down the origin of tarot cards and finding out that they were playing cards and I didn't just stop and go oh they're playing cards that took on a life of their own I was like what was the intention behind making these playing cards even the way that they are? Because eventually they're going to be made into some type of fortune-telling thing. The energy that continues to follow these cards, no matter even if it's a deck that's based on Rider or even anything from the Golden Dawn age, it's just astounding that there is some type of mysticism and magic that's been able to continuously grow over time and I do hate that we don't know like the very very beginning of where it went I think you're absolutely correct in saying it was around Italy um I I remember finding even old tarot decks online that were just the playing cards in origin but I mean they were disintegrating just because the paper that they were even printed on at the time was not meant to last definitely into our day and age but when you talk about the feeling of realizing your unbinding ancestral trauma. Is there a way that you can describe it for a beginner that just happened to come across generational trauma and how to heal those wounds, especially when your own history, even of European descent, has been so muddled and written over and destroyed that you don't even know what your original origin is of your ancestors before Europe? Yeah, that's an amazing question. Um, Well, 
I think the key is to get still and to tap into your inner knowing first. Like that's, and that's a whole, I'm sure you talk about that a lot on this podcast, but. Um, it, it happens to be brought up, but I think anybody who's actually doing any sort of work, that meditation, whatever you want to call it, communion, sitting with yourself in silence and going within definitely right. always needs to be said on every episode, you know? So um, a good um, marker for anything that is um, like a an energetic trigger is when you have a really strong emotional or physical, physiological, psychological response to something that doesn't seem to make sense, that kind of comes out of nowhere. Like if you're extremely like... If you're listening to me describe the history of colonization and something I said pissed you off, well, maybe I was just being an ass, but also maybe you have some healing to do around that particular issue, right? That's just an example. And like, you know, I was finding that come up in in myself um, through this process. I would recognize like, why am I feeling so strongly about this? Why is it pissing me off that these correspondences are like this? You know, it's making me angry, you know, like this makes no sense. I'm getting mad at a pack of cards, you know, like, like, fuck, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, that's a really good sign that there is something there. Now, in, in terms of like recognizing whether it's something you hold in your own personal uh, matrix of, of energies or something that's in your ancestral line, um, that's something that really requires introspection. And it's something that only you can answer, really. I mean, you can go to another healer that is uh, tuned into these things, but no one's actually really going to know except for you. So if you feel like that's true, it probably is, you know, and that's, and if it's not, then, you know, what's the harm in thinking it is, you know, I mean. <laughs> well, I love that you bring it up like, hey, you can go and get some assistance with yourself, but ultimately, like, you are the, you are the decider of your discernment and your intuition. So I know that there have been almost like pitfalls in the journey where you obviously want assistance. But my favorite thing that has ever happened to me is when I have found stuff on my own and then I've went to get help from my spiritual friends and the validation of my meditation through these other vessels is probably one of my favorite parts about the spiritual work. I think it goes with saying that people can still um, fuck it up in the nicest way ever in a beginning stance where you go to this person who has all this spiritual experience and then you deny your own intuition because you're just a beginner, you don't know how to listen to yourself or whatever excuse you give yourself for invalidating the information rising up in you and taking what this spiritual person you might have accidentally put on a pedestal is saying to you. And I've had, probably why the safe space exists, I've had people in my corner, in my lives where whether I realized it was not necessarily a pedestal, but I really valued their perspective. I valued what they were saying, whether it was channeling, chanting, tarot, whatever you want to call it. Um, And I would always write it down and I would come home and I would think about it. And in the beginning, it annoyed me that like it didn't line up and I wanted to go into old traumatic pathways where, oh, it must be me again, you know, because this person's so certified, this person, so this, they're so beyond me. And I realized that that's even a trauma pattern in myself that I had to really, really address, especially with the work I do and meeting so many practitioners and so many different ways of lives. Different ways of life? Yes. Um, That I had to address that myself, that at the end of the day, I have my discernment, my gut feelings, and my meditations to go to. And I really am just going to have to take mine for my perspective as this is what works for me. But going back to, again, going and getting Reiki or Tara, whatever you really want to go to, there's so many ways that you can get help. I just strongly advise whatever you do, whoever you go to, just go home and reflect on it and write on it and make sure that 
it's true for you and it's not true because a practitioner who's highly evolved, yada, 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 told you so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I personally am constantly evaluating everything with my internal truth meter, you know, like that's maybe obsessively, <laughs> but especially in a healing context where I'm opening myself to another person and they're, sh and they're reflecting things back to me. Like that's a time to be extra diligent with like with your truth meter and being real real with it. If, if something doesn't feel right it's probably not right for you mm -hmm. just let it go you know it's not important you don't have to accept uh, anyone's word as your truth mm -hmm. we all have free will <laughs> i just always want to let that linger um, so before we get out of here, I want you to talk to me about your sound transmissions and then where we can find you to get in contact with you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, um, I'm on all the things. Uh, not a Brahmananda. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, so just shoot me a message on there. Um, there's also, uh, the black magic underground. If you're interested in, um, being informed about those events, blackmagicunderground.com. And yeah, the sound transmissions, um, I'm going to have, uh, an event here in Albuquerque coming up soon. I also have some stuff in Kansas in August, um, probably going to be uh, holding a couple sound temple events and doing a workshop series on the uh, mysticism of sound. And so if you connect with my sound transmissions, what's coming through me and you want to know more mystic mysticism of sound is a great place to explore that where I will share a little bit behind my practice and how I connect with the sound current and some of the mechanics behind um, yeah, vibration and energy and like how I, how I see things um it's not uh it's probably a different perspective uh it's may maybe um it's not something that i was taught it was just something that i remembered so um yeah if it is something that calls to you it'll welcome me into that space um the sound transmissions that come through for the sound temple events or really you know, all of the events that i do include some form of sound transmission um they are always fully improvised. I call it spiritual jazz. It's like my modern take on spiritual jazz. If only I could play the piano better, that'd be lovely. But <laughs> you and me both yeah, said. there's a lot of chants that come through, sometimes chants from earthly traditions, sometimes often chants in a prayer language that is um, that comes through from my celestial inner, uh, lineage. And uh, I incorporate a lot of, you know, I grew up in the rave scene on steady diet of hip hop and punk rock. And I incorporate most of those influences into what I do minus the punk rock. Um, so there's an electronic beat based kind of um, down temple feel down temple. I said, I liked that. I think that's been taken um, down tempo feel to a lot of tracks um, incorporating different frequencies and uh, effects to really kind of allow whatever is coming through in the moment, which is this just expression of divinity that is come flowing through in this particular uh, moment um, through sound. The sound is the carrier wave for a deeper energetic expression that is a conscious entity that wants to interact with you through this medium of sound vibration. Wonderfully said. And for all of my Listeners and friends out there joining us for the first time or for every episode, you always know you can click the description, whatever streaming platform you're on. You'll find the description of the episode, where to contact with Nada, and all of my information. Just to plug myself really quick on my own show, but I do have a Facebook page called Safe Space with Cheyenne Podcast, and I love to keep people up to date on all the things that I'm researching, my own personal healing journey, and promoting all the people on the show as well. My favorite thing to do besides running content on my Facebook and talking to people like Nada Brahma is also reading book excerpts on TikTok. I have a stash behind me and all the authors that I introduce send me their books and I get to read pieces for you as well. So before we get off of here, 
I just want to let you guys know I love you so much. And I found a clip from Nightcap. I know I've been talking to you guys about these. Fellas, I have to go see them. They are from Austin, Texas. I just have a feeling they're going to blow up. Their sound is amazing. And they just released a new song called Glimpse. So Vitality Exposed Performance Photography is going to bring you Glimpse by Nightcap. And we'll see you guys on the other episode. And I love you so, 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 so much. This is the Hoosier Media Network, your home for podcasting.